we have not like, have we formally met? If we have, it's, it was years ago, I think. It's been a while, a long while, and it wasn't yeah. an educational purpose. So it was come and go. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. I think down in Oregon City, maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. But um, anyway, I just wanted to talk to you today to ask you about your story because I'm really um, very interested in promoting home education and bringing families back together and um, just doing all I can to help people who are thinking about this to see how it's really done, you know, how it's in a grassroots way. What it looks like. When, what when it looks in like real to life. get started. Yeah. <laughs> re, re, yep. Excellent. Well, um, and I think I, I love this idea because everyone's going to have a little different version of what happened to them and how they got where they were. So um, I wasn't ever planning on home, home educating my children. And I didn't even know that was an option. I grew up in the public school system. And when my husband and I had two small children, they weren't quite school age yet we'd already talked about you know we thought about sending them to a private school or catholic school actually to go get their education because we saw what was going on in this in the public school system and it's like "Hmm, i think we want to choose a little bit more wisely and then he met so so quick question what was it about the public system that that sent red flags up for you and your husband uh there were just the behavior issues and the focus it wasn't really on education. It's on the social things about how, who gets along with who. And I mean, they're trying to do education too, but there's a lot of social things that are happening. And so social engineering more, more than just your basic teaching, reading, teaching, writing. Right. And, and there, um, and even though I didn't know a word for it back then, but there were, there are a lot of different worldviews that are being taught. (laughs) So I know that word now. So when, so when was this? What year was this? Um, the, not, let's see, it was before 2000. It was in the, um, ni- the late 1990s. Okay. And so is when we had had those little children. And so we just thought, it's just like, okay, you know, we've got some years to, to work on figuring out what we exactly what we want to do. <laughs> and my husband met a family and he came home, he's like, Cher, you've got to meet this family. They're amazing. And they homeschool and their kids aren't socially backward. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'd never known any homeschooling families. I, and he had, and they were, the children were very socially backward and did not know how to interact with others. And so he said, you've got to meet them. And I was like, okay, I'll meet them. And so I got to meet the family <laughs> and the mom and I started walking in the mornings together and talking about homeschooling. And I, oh, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, it's not brain surgery. I, I could do this. And since my, <laughs> young, my oldest at that time was going to be heading, um, he actually went to preschool in the public school system to also get some speech therapy. And so I was, he was in the public school system in that regard. And I was such an active mom in the school room. I knew all the kids and I knew their names. I knew what they did. And I knew exactly what my son brought home from them. (laughs) So it's like, I, and, and so it was during that period of time. It's like, okay, (laughs) I, I could do this. And, and so we, we brought him home for schooling and he continued to have some speech therapy um, help with that, with his um, de- speech delay. But it was, it was really fun. I mean, who wouldn't want to do kindergarten at home with your kids? I thought it was just lots and lots of fun. Right. <laughs> and so we had a great time. We played and my, um, my, my second child was with us and she just got to play. She loved it. And, and then we moved to um, another state and my husband went back to school and did it for a career change. And I loved it because it gave us so much flexibility to be together as a family. Right. We could take dad to school and come back home and do our schooling and then go and pick him up and have dinner together. And then he'd study 
But if they would have been on a normal school schedule, they would not have seen dad. They would have had to leave before he had to get up and leave. And then mm -hmm. they would have to be in bed before he got home from school and got everything done with studies. It just would have been a, a really sad situation, but we were able yeah. to be very flexible. And I love that. But I have to tell you though, I was duplicating school at home, which is not necessarily a very good idea. <laughs> right. As my children got older, um, one of the amazing public, um, amazing public fails or mom fails of, of my life was I remember bringing my children home after dropping dad off at school and I sat him down at the table. It's like, it's school time and you're going to do your schoolwork. And yeah. I had a very different view of what, of education than I do now. And I was like, get your work done. You know how to do it. Just get it done. And so we literally had a battle of wills, eight mm -hmm. hours eight hours of them sitting at the table and playing around and not doing their worksheet. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, why does this work at, in a classroom? Why mm. does this work? Why can't I do this uh, at home? Why do they not listen? Why don't they just do it? I mean, at school, they just sit there and do it. Why can't this happen? <laughs> right. It was, I mean, that's yeah, what everybody weird. asks themselves. Right? Well, at home. Yeah, it is not, it's not the, I don't have the same relationship with my children as a teacher would where they have an authority, uh, authoritarian situation where if you don't get done what I tell you to do, I can keep you in for recess. I can send a bad note home to your mom. I, you know, you can get demerits or whatever. Well, or there's, it's just the herd, it's the herd mentality, right? I mean, everybody's yeah. running off the cliff. I'm going to run off the cliff with everybody else. Everybody else is sitting there doing it except for, you know, the couple over there of kids that are cutting up or whatever. So I don't want to be the bad kid. I want to sit and do my work and, and get the, you know, the teacher's approval. You just can't right. duplicate that. Right. Nor would you want to not when you find the proper system for learning. No, there are so many other ways and means to encourage love of learning. And I, that was, and when we were um, at, at a, in the, we were actually in the east, eastern part of the United States at that time. And I met an incredible family that also homeschooled. We had really similar age children. And we decided to do a, a, a science day together with our kids. And so we brought all of our littles together and we had science and we had so much fun. And I realized through that and a couple of other experiences there's a way to encourage love of learning versus force. I am going to make you do this just because there's a checklist. Right. I'm going to tell for you what you've got to, what you need to know. Right. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. the list of scope and sequence for different the school districts is, is real. And it's just like, I can go through the list or I can encourage you to love to learn. And yes, we can, we're not ignoring the reality of, I need to learn math. It's, it's a really helpful thing. So you're, you can function in the world and not mm -hmm. be cheated, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But there's a way to make it go down very well and pleasantly, or I hate math. And once I'm done with school, I know people that they're, you know, I'm done with math and I am done with school. I will never do math again. And they, they fight it. And it's like, Oh, I love, I, you know, I love algebra because I use it almost every single day. Really? I have an unknown. <laughs> <laughs> I have an unknown. So therefore we use an, you know, a letter instead of a number. And I need to figure out how to make, you know, make this work. Geometry, use it. Not every single oh, day. Yeah. Geometry. Yeah. Now. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure if I thought about it, I probably use geometry a lot more than I give it credit. But anyway, there are lots of different applications. So I, I just love this. So I, was influenced greatly. And I see, see fingerprints of that particular mom and family all over my day, every single day, because mm -hmm. I want my children to love to learn. And I still get calls mm -hmm. from my adult children. It's like, mom, thanks for helping us to learn to love to learn because it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I get to do this and this and this. And I also have met others that it's a chore and it's a, I must be forced. And it's so sad. So so that's how we got I, into I, We homeschooling. were just together with, mm -hmm. we were just together with our, um, our three younger children and then my daughter who lives in Oregon city. And, 
you know, inevitably somebody brings something up and somebody challenges it and they get on their phones and they, they research it all and they have this big discussion. And I just, I sit back, I just love it. And sometimes I'll, I'll just bring stuff up to, to prompt that because I love to watch them. That's, they learn to love to learn. I mean, I was not a perfect homeschooler either. I, I, I didn't have the support system that you, you guys have put together with your, your school, but um, I love the fact that they had plenty of time to explore their own interests. So now that's what they do and they're off time. <laughs> Oh, it's, that's wonderful. It, it becomes a natural uh, family culture. Yes. And it's, and it's interesting as, so those two children I started out with are now adults and grown and gone. And, and the children that have come since then, it's incredible to see that how they have been influenced by their older siblings. And in this culture of, we love to learn, we love to read, we love to discuss it continues on. So the seven-year-old knows that we're going to discuss things. We're going to discuss worldviews and what happens. And we're going to, um, you know, we talk about so many things from history and science and math all Mm -hmm. mixed in together with real life. So yeah, my my youngest son, in fact, my youngest son was, um, he said, mom, you've got to watch this, this Jordan Peterson clip. And he, 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 he texted it to me and then we sat and listened to it while we were fixing stuff for 4th of July. And then later he was sitting on the, on the couch and I said, Oh, what are you reading? And he turns the book over. He's reading animal farm. He just spontaneously went and found that book because he had heard about it in something. And, you know, it was a quick read he could do over the weekend. And so, I mean, it's just that sort of thing, you know, it's the continually um, being curious that, that is said, that's the biggest benefit. It's a lifetime of benefit. Yes. In fact, this morning I was talking to my husband. I said, I just in the middle, I'm in the middle of listening to something and I think we need to listen to it as a family and have a discussion. Mm -hmm. And he goes, excellent schedule it. And (laughs) so we do that and we're going to have, you know, we've got multiple things, not just, not just with other people that we're doing book discussions with or other activities and learning experiences with, but within our family too, so that we're all together. Right. And one of the most influential books that I read uh, was Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. Yes. And I, as he, I don't know, know if all your uh, listeners will know this, but he was a public school teacher. He was in the public school system. And mm-hmm. the book is a compilation of speeches that he gave, many of which were at, um, at events where he received honors. <laughs> for being like the mm-hmm. teacher of the year in the state. Yeah. And, and he's saying <laughs> he's trashing the public system. Yes. He absolutely <laughs> thrashes it and brings it down. It's like, this is what I'm supposed to be teaching. You know, like this, the, this, I think the first one is the seven lessons school teacher. I love going through that because I, I realized after like, I think the second time I was reading through it, it's like, you know what? He's telling exactly as a public school teacher, what's wrong. And, and I said, you know what, I could probably look at this and not just look at it as what's wrong, but what needs to be fixed and what I can do as a parent and as a mentor Mm -hmm. in a, in a class setting, what am I supposed to do? And and it's an incredible, and I I actually brought it up because there's one quote that I wanted to read from, um, from here. It's actually from, we need less school, not more. Again, one of his other speeches, Mm -hmm. he said, whatever an education is, it should make you a unique individual, not a conformist. It should furnish you with an original spirit with which to tackle the big challenges. It should allow you to find values which will be your roadmap through life. It should make you spiritually rich, a person who loves whatever you are doing, wherever you are, wherever you are, whomever you are with. It should teach you what is important, how to live and how to die. Wow. And that it, that's what it is. That's what I've tried yeah. to do. And we don't always, I mean, there are some amazing teachers out there and yeah. even I, my father-in-law was a teacher and he did incredible things. I just can't take, I'm not going to take the chance of whether or not we're going to get that type of a teacher 
and what they're well, yeah to. because they're few and, and far between yes that's the truth i mean um you know we we know what's going on in the education schools and colleges education departments right we we know what's going on there and it's not teaching this yeah. this sort of mentality of learning to love to learn mm -hmm. and i think that also encompasses honoring who our children are they are such unique individuals any mom that's had more than two children you know more than one child goes like oh my goodness did that could i get a roadmap for this one or an instruction manual for this one and this one because they're totally different <laughs> and and i i appreciate yeah, I the know. learning yeah. that i have had in order to be able to honor their uniqueness and their strengths and their abilities their passions their gifts and let them yeah. do that and use those, you know, allow them to use those to even tackle the harder subjects for them. And yeah. it's like, okay, this, this, Absolutely. Uh, if reading and writing is hard for you, let's you use your other gifts and strengths to help you learn that. If math is hard, let's use these other gifts and talents and skills and passions to help you get through this. And so right. it, it allows them to to know that they're good. They're inherently yeah. good the way that God made them. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter was in between two math geniuses and she hated math. <laughs> and we had, you know, it took, it was, it was, but she's, she's a very, um, she's a great creative writer and she was very musically talented, talented. And you know, that lesson of you're not going to be good at everything not everything's going to come naturally to you. You, you need to, to be satisfied with the gifts that you've been given and develop those that are you're weaker in. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to go into something that you don't have to be a math genius. And that is a gift they need for what they're going into because they both went into business and accounting. So, you know, I would, they're not geniuses, right? I mean, but from her perspective, right. Just pick it up, you know, and just go through it. And she struggled and struggled and struggled with it. And it would get very unhappy. And I'd say, if you're, if you're hating it, just walk away. Okay. If you can come about this with the spirit and, and, um, you know, humbly ask for the Lord's help and learn it, then that's good. But if you're going to hate it and, and if it's going to be a, a huge battle, then don't do it. And so eventually she got through it, but she did it at her own pace, but it was always the comparing, you know, learning not to compare yourself is another huge benefit that you don't get you can only teach that at home right it's too prevalent in 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 the public system it's too emphasized and you can't get away from that because you're in a herd so it's all those little life lessons right and also to be able to be happy for someone else that is really good at yes. that and yes. not um not tear them down because you yes. have a strength that they have a weakness in and right. vice versa that recognizing that we all have our parts to play and we all have a special gift. Um, C.S. Lewis's membership is a great reminder of that every time yeah, I read yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Well, that's great. So how many kids did you end up having? And I wanted to go back to um, the comment that you made at the very beginning about the social, you know, uh, awkwardness of homeschoolers, because that is the number one thing you know, response that you get about homeschooling is, oh, my kid's going to be socially awkward. So um, how, how did you, I mean, how, how did you address that in your head? You know, how did you overcome that worry? I mean, you, you knew somebody, right? You said you finally met somebody that was, you didn't feel had that issue. And so. Well, I didn't know anyone growing up that was, had homeschooled or I knew people in public school that were socially backward too. So <laughs> there you so go. My had specifically known homeschooling families right. that were very socially awkward and didn't. Why do you it. think that is? I mean, I want to talk about that. Why do you think, why do you think that is? Because we, I, I knew people that were socially awkward and, you know, homeschoolers too. And I came to the same conclusion. It was like, but I know socially awkward kids in the public system. So it can't have anything to do with where they're educated. I, I personally think that it was a, an environment 
that the parents, because uh, it's like, are were the parents socially awkward too? Did they have a hard time in social settings? And yeah. I don't remember that discussion, but um, John Taylor Gatto actually re, um, addresses social learning. And he goes, uh, can your children work with all age groups? And my children have been exposed to all age groups and they can, they mm -hmm. can work very nicely with adults and elderly, more mature people and youth and little ones too. And so I think that ability yeah. Yeah. of, I, I think the biggest thing that they would, it's like, do they fit in? Do they know what the right clothes are? You know, the most fashionable clothes right now. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. depending on your family, whether you go to public school or not, your family may or may not put a lot of priority on that or value on that. Right. And right. so, you know, are, was that particular family that my husband was thinking of, did they go to events in the community? Did they participate in sports? Did they, did they do theater? Did they do all of these different things? I don't know. I don't know, yeah. but I think that right. we need to be reminded that we have so many social opportunities and my kids, because they have been homeschooled, they just got to have a bigger age group to work with instead of just, you know, a year and a half to two years worth of these right. people that I can communicate with, talk with, and everyone else <laughs> right. have to either be quiet or I need to tell them what to do <laughs> because you know, right. where am I on the, the ladder right. of authority. Oh, that, that is, that is so true. And, and that's the, the laboratory of small groups. And I, and I have to say that, um, um, one of the things that came up um, a couple of years ago when I had a meeting here with some moms that were, they were, they were going crazy with the public system. They wanted to take their kids out. And I, I made, made that, um, that point to them that, you know, you, you have to have in real life, you have to have uh, lots of people that you can talk to. You need to know these kids when they're 10 need to know how to talk to a two-year-old. And they need to talk, need to know how to talk to a 90 year old Yes. in order to be really effective in life. You can't just get in, in your, you, in this little narrow focus that, you know, we're, we're channeled into for some strange reason. And then later they become teens and they're, they feel very awkward around children or they feel very awkward around old people or whatever, because they haven't had that exposure growing up and they don't know how to adapt. Right. right. So tell me how you got involved with TJ Ed a little bit. That's rather funny. Uh, a friend of ours in Michigan gave us an audio CD to look, listen to. And it talked about leadership education or Thomas Jefferson education philosophy. And we were listening Do you remember to what it. what year this was? Um, it was before 2003. I'm trying to remember anyway <laughs> um might have been 2000 it might have been 2003 2004 somewhere in there mm -hmm. um it's a blur that period of time <laughs> right anyway <th> we <laughs> listened to it I, I know but I do remember we were listening to it in the car and my husband we stopped that he stopped the cd and he goes that is a really great idea that's amazing but it's not real you have to force people to learn. You have to force kids to learn or else they won't do it. You have to force them. It's mm. like, okay, all right. And so now, had you we, already kind of discovered that that wasn't working for you at home? I, by that time I had, I, I yeah, didn't go already into that going, very far. Yeah, I can't, I can like, do that. Well, you know, as my mind flashes back to forcing those kids to finish their worksheets at the table. <laughs> <laughs> That worked so well. And they learned so much that day. You know, mm. what was the lesson at that particular time? Mom is in charge and you must obey, yeah. you know, get the whole brows being furrowed. That's right. Right. <laughs> and you have to obey whoever's above you and where, where is your place on the, the authority totem pole? Right. It just, it just is. Yeah. And so I was just like, well, you know, I'd already realized that that's not going to work in that setting. But, but as he was, as Oliver DeMille was talking about 
teenagers. It's like, well, I thought, well, maybe it might work. And he says he knows people that it worked with. And, but I really liked the philosophy of, you know, having, helping them to love to learn and, and, and going back into classics and, and it's like, well, okay. So I just kind of dabbled a little bit and read a couple more things. It's like, I like this. I can see where I can apply this. And anywhere I applied it, it worked really, really well. And I continued on. Uh, we moved back west after my husband was finished with school. And he was playing in an, in an orchestra. And I was there early with him. And so I was just in the audience, just reading my, a book. And someone came up and said, hey, that's a really good book. And I go, it is. And she, and so we just start, started this conversation and she had started a Commonwealth in the area. And that's how I got involved with a Commonwealth and, and leadership education in a group setting. Right. So, so to clarify for our listeners, a Commonwealth is what a homeschool group is called in the Thomas Jefferson education system which is, which is growing. It's a growing mm-hmm. system. It's been going on and it's based on Oliver DeMille's uh, books called uh, Thomas, Je- Thomas Jefferson Education and the Phases of Learning. Five Phases of Learning? The Phases of Learning? I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, because I have it, but it's been a little while. But um, I, I felt, you know, when, and I just got involved with, with one here on the east side because I'm still homeschooling my grandkids a couple of days a week during the school year. And while my daughter's in a, um, she's in a, she's finishing up her occupational therapy assistant program for, it was a two year program. She's got one more year. And I, you know, I never knew these Commonwealths existed. I started homeschooling in 1997 when I was just first pregnant with my sixth child. And um, we were in California. And then the next year we moved up here and we, we, homeschooled with a couple of other families over, over the years, but I never even heard of a Commonwealth and I didn't get exposed to um, Thomas Jefferson education until about 2003 or four is when I got involved with it. But he, in those books, he doesn't talk about Commonwealths and stuff. No, it, this is something that kind of evolved later. I, I think it did afterwards um, centered around um, Anality Milne and Tiffany Earle. Yeah. And it's like, we need a situation where we can have these types of principles in a group setting. And yes, they need, they need peers that can yeah. appreciate. We love to learn and it's okay to do hard things in this learning environment and right. stretch and grow. And moms need the support too, because you can feel very Absolutely. isolated as a homeschooler. And we were fortunate to have two families that were uh, really good. And, and um, we had really like, we only got together once a week just to do like you're saying science things or history units or, you know, go to OMSI or whatever, you know, whatever right. we did. And, and those, bo- those kids all became best of friends. They're still best of friends. They still um, are best friends with all those kids. <laughs> so and my kids ended up going up to Mount Hood at 15 at community college. And all my kids, but the oldest one went up there. My, my oldest son, uh, bless his heart. He's a, he's a lawyer in Vegas, very successful lawyer there married and has four little girls, but he was my epic fail, (laughs) both public school and homeschooling. I, that guy had one interest and it was orange and round and bounced. And that was it. And (laughs) there's nothing you could not convince him that he was not going to be an NBA star. I mean, mom, if I just work hard enough at this, I will make it. I, I will. Okay. I'm like, honey. Okay. Can we just have a plan B for just in case, you just know? In case. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I won't go into his story long term, but it, it's not pretty, but he eventually <laughs> went into the Marines at 24. And that was finally the catalyst that kind of got him into real reality. <laughs> Wow. I mean, um, there's nothing. I tried to uh, apply the TJ ed principles with him and, and he was one that just was going to have to learn the hard way, but we didn't have the support. You know, I think if we had had a, if, for him, if we had had the group that would have made the whole difference. 
I think I even took my younger kids to one of um, Oliver's camps down in Cedar City and they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. They just didn't feel like they were just independent learners by that time. They were all just Mm -hmm. in their own grooves. And anyway, so it's, uh, I think the moral of my story is that you, you can have epic fails, but if you have a culture in your home, they pick it up. They eventually, they eventually get there and they will eventually be. And in fact, Drew was just telling me, I just on the phone and he was telling me about this, this big success he had with this client he has that he had a real breakthrough in how to really streamline this ongoing thing that he has to do this ongoing client and uh, with it's a garbage collection company. And anyway, and it's simply because he just duck buckled down and, and did some research and figured out how to make it better. So, I mean, it's not over just because they turn 18. Yes. <laughs> it's ongoing. The culture carries through, you know? And I think as parents, we get to show that too, because I know I'm continuing to learn. My husband's continue to learn and we're, we're not, we're, you're never done. It, it, we're yeah, just not never. done. And if, if okay, we have so, that attitude of I can continue and I don't have to have a teacher telling me what to do and what to learn and how to learn and right. where to go. That's a huge boon and a huge help to yourself and to our children. It, oh, oh my gosh. It makes the difference between success and failure. Doesn't it? I mean, it gets, that's the natural self-esteem generator right there. Yes. So just briefly, um, you got involved in the Commonwealth, which was, had already started up and how long it had, had it been going? I, I'm not sure you, how long it had been going, but we just jumped in and my, my oldest son at that point was just turning 12. And so he could start some projects that they were doing and it's like, okay, great. This would be super fun. So gosh, you'd been at this, what, uh, eight years or something, six, eight years. You'd been homeschooling already. Uh-huh. Okay. Wow. That's, that's really hanging on. Of course, the earlier years are a little bit, once you get over that hump of not, you know, making them do stuff and you start having fun with it, it does, it just, it's a snowball right? Yes. It does. It starts a life of its own. And then the Commonwealth comes around just at the perfect time. Wow. <laughs> and now you're really, really super, you're into the training. I mean, you've been through years of, of how long has it been now you've been in it then? So the Commonwealth, I, I think com, as far as Commonwealths and doing the, the scholar projects through Lemmy Leadership Education Mentoring Institute, it's been, mm-hmm probably a little over 10 years because I've done I think um wow it's yeah it's been over 10 years because I went to training in 2010 I think it was 2010 I went to my first training to help out with one of the projects and having experienced it with my son because he would still have um at this is the same son that would had taken the speech therapy and his reading skills and were a little bit delayed because if Mm -hmm. you can't even produce the sounds it's like you know when he learned different things it was just it was just a little bit later (laughs) but he could understand it wasn't that he was dumb it was he just couldn't produce the sounds and there if therefore if you can't produce the sounds and you don't hear them quite the way that you think they are being said it makes a huge challenge to learn how to read but he understood Mm -hmm. And so we would listen to audiobooks. I would read his book, uh, read out loud to him and to the rest of the family. And, and we just had an incredible experience going through it. And there were, uh, he also took a Shakespeare class and it was amazing. I hadn't really been introduced to Shakespeare in this way and it was not at all frightening. It was just an adventure. And so my family and I, from then on, wow, we, we love Shakespeare and the plays <laughs> and the words and we have a lot of fun. So that was my first training That's was so cool. with Shakespeare and taught for many I've taught for many, many years there and a lot of oh, other projects, that so. is so cool. That is so cool. I can't we're gonna do that in our Commonwealth this year for the first time. And and my oh. granddaughter is 
she's just kind of reading now. She's 13. Mm -hmm. She's just, and her mom really didn't read till she was 12 either. She could sound out words, but she had zero comprehension. And and Ellie's not, not, uh, and and I'm like, Shakespeare. Okay. (laughs) Well, we'll see how this goes. (laughs) And I think even those situations, I mean, yes, they will totally get it. Um, my, my seven-year-old asked me to, um, she's like, well, actually it was last summer because I remember I was in the middle of a training and I was in between the sessions and I could get a little bit to eat and we were having a break. And I came upstairs and grabbed something to eat and a drink of water. And my older, older son was like, just ask her. It's okay. Just ask her. I'm like, what? Ask me what? And she's (laughs) like, Oh, mom, will you, will you teach me how to read eventually? Was, and it's like, yeah, she, I'm sure. I'd love to teach you to read. I mean, she's been working on words wow. and different things all along and we still do ABCs. She just wanted to specifically learn how to read. And it's, it's like, yeah, she's helped all of us. She can help you too. <laughs> it's yeah. like, great. And so here she's trying to work on learning how to read. And this morning we're reading together and she got a verse while we're reading scriptures and and the, the word started with B. And so it must be behold. And it's like, no, l- look at all the letters. And we go through and my, my daughter home, at home, she's like, oh, mom, how can you stand this? She's just guessing. And it's like, every one of you have gone through this little stage. You get to a word, <laughs> it starts with a certain letter. And you just think it's a word that you, you just forget look, to look at the rest of the letters. It's okay. Because I know she'll get it. <laughs> Yeah. And having that faith that she's going to be able to get it and she'll be there. I expect her, you know, when in less than five years, she will be reading the constitution of the United States by herself and looking up words and comprehending what it's saying. I totally see her doing that. And not a problem because she wants to do it. The, The whole enchilada is their desire. It's not, it's not that they're immediately succeeding. It's that they have a desire to succeed Uh and you know because you're being patient and you're just being loving and you're just allowing them to go through the process that they'll get it I mean it's not there's no question in your mind yeah (laughs) when you were talking I was reminded my my littlest was three years younger than than his his next sibling which was then then he had a brother and a sister a year apart and so I started homeschooling when they were two and three and then I'm, you know, teaching their, their older brother that was seven and eight and whatever. And he, he really struggled in school too, because he's very auditory. And so the visual with reading was, was difficult for him even just to sit down and he's got ADHD and whatever. So, you know, I'm going through teaching Nick and then I teaching Jake and Maddie and uh, through the years, you know, as Zeph, sweet little perfect little kid is you just sit on the floor and play with Legos or blocks or whatever while I'm doing, you know, school with all the rest of the kids. And then when he got to be about five or six, I said, you want, you, you, have, you curious about how to read? And he says, no. Okay. okay. You know? And so then the next year I, I said to him, Zeph, do you want to, you want to learn how to read? And he goes, no. I said, okay. okay. And, and then, and then one day, um, we were, we sat down to scripture study and he was sitting on John's lap, my husband, and, uh, we're all taking a turn and it comes to John and he, he looks up and he goes, can I, can I read? And, and John says, sure. So he starts to whisper the words in his, in his ear and Zeph just starts reading. He'd been reading all along (laughs) as he was following along the scripture study and he was just picking up the words and he never, when he was confident that he could read, then he wanted to read. He didn't want to learn how to read me teaching him. He wanted to just do it. And he'd been hearing the, the N says, N, and the I says, you know, whatever it was teaching the other kids. And he figured it out. And, it out. and he knew, great. And then I said, would you like to do math? And he said, okay. He sat down. He already knew how to do money. He already knew how to do time. He already knew his, all, he already knew it all. He'd just been sitting there absorbing it. <laughs> and he just didn't want to have to sit down and and fill out the worksheets or whatever we didn't do right. worksheets, but I mean, fill out, he just, he'd, he'd already figured it out. <laughs> I That's was like, great. you little Turkey. 
I didn't and even they, get to teach them how to read because I love I love to teach reading. But and I recognizing mean, that they have different. those strengths that you know to take initiative, but in their own way. Yeah. The special, you know, that we all have. We're all smarts. Yeah. We all have genius in our own special way, and to have that affirmed, it's like just let me know if you want any 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 help, or you know. Yeah. One of the things that I would do, um, we meet with our children. We try to meet with our children regularly. It's like, how are things going with your goals and what you're working on? And I'll check in with them about specific things about schooling. But as they get older, they'll check in with dad about certain things. And because not everything's my forte and I'm not really good right. at all of the things. And so they, you know, they'll check in with dad. We'll find a tutor. We'll find someone else that can, that can help them that they need help with a certain subject. Lots of resources. We're not well, stuck you. with just mine. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And I don't know how long you have for me. Cause I think we could talk for a long time, <laughs> but I did want to ask you, that was the one last thing I wanted to, to ask you about is because my, my focus in doing this is really mentorship. I want to teach people how to mentor their children, whether they're going to full on homeschool or whether you're just trying to reconnect with your kids because they're so addicted to screens, right? Turn off the screens and, and fill that void with self-improvement and goal setting and things you as a parent are doing and your child is choosing to do and that you're doing together. And um, so Tell me a little bit about how you mentor your children in that way. You mentioned it a little bit ago, but yeah. I mean, how often do you meet and how do you determine what their goals are and so forth? Or how do they determine it? And what do you, okay. what's your system for keeping track of it? And so in uh, Oliver, De, Oliver and Rachel DeMille's book, the phases of learning, they talk about meeting with your children every week. And years ago, when I'd read the book initially, it was actually when I was when I was first introduced to the Commonwealth schools, um, I talked to my husband about, it's like, can we meet every week with the children and, and talk to them about, you know, what their goals are and how they're doing and how we can help them and just be able to talk. Mm -hmm. And he goes, that is way too often. Once a month is plenty. And so our goal was once a month. And after a year, we re evaluated how we were doing. We hadn't met one time. And so it's like, okay, Ooh. once a month, it didn't happen. It was so <laughs> odd and out of place. And I just yeah. laugh thinking about that. It's like, and we took a whole year to evaluate that. Um, couldn't we like take a month? <laughs> anyway, other, other issues. I mean, life happens, right? So right. that happened and it, it was just really funny to think about it now, but then it's like, well, still not once a week. That's way too often. And it's like, well, can we do, you know, it's like, we tried it some more. Anyway, we eventually went with the once a week goal of mm -hmm. meeting with our children. And it's amazing because life happens. Mm -hmm. If we had once a week and we had family over and an event or, you know, just all these things on the day that we specified that we would do it, then we could meet like two times, maybe three times. There are some times that we actually met four times with the children. Wow. It was amazing. And so, <laughs> so we have stayed with the, the goal is once a week on, we, we happen to use Sundays because that's the day mm -hmm. we typically are all home right. and we don't have as many family events and it's, it's just a fabulous time to meet with them. Talk, how are you doing? How are things going? How are your relationships with your siblings? And mm -hmm. how are, you know, how are these studies going? I know I noticed that such and such you're working on this project because it's still on the kitchen table mm -hmm. uh, or wherever in the family room <laughs> and how's that coming along you know just we have that time to be able to talk and discuss and older children will spend more time on goals and their studies and how we can help and you know mom I need to have such and such a book I'm on my second to the last lesson I need this next one have you ordered it already and it's like oh let me write that down Okay. Yeah, let me do it right now. I will order it tomorrow morning. <laughs> and, and so, and there are times it's like, Hey mom, actually it goes, dad, mom keeps on asking me to help with the baby and I can't get my studies done. It's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so sometimes we'd have a checkup on how mom's doing 
during this, it's like, so how am I doing at respecting your time to study? It's like, you're doing better, but you still ask me on such and such a time. It's like, okay. So, you yeah. know, Cher, when I first started, when I first embarked on this, I thought, you know, what can I, what can I say to people you know, what, what, what concrete things can I give to people to help them fill that void? If, if you're, you can't just say, I'm going to take your phone away and, you know, amuse yourself. It just doesn't work. That that's a recipe for a lot of resentment. And when I, I kept thinking about this because it's so obvious, right. And yet, and so simple, but people just simply do not do it. And, and you hit on that. I mean, lots of great ideas thinking about doing it, but not doing it. <laughs> They're just not going to, unless you just make this decision that this is going to be the priority and you set aside that time, right? Making, making the actual appointment with make, your spouse the appointment. and your children. Yeah. And making, mm-hmm. and, and then checking yeah. up on. There's ourselves. just no substitute. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and reevaluating. And I, I've just written, um, I wrote a book just because I, I felt like the first phase of getting your family back together or having some sort of program is just, it's writing that family mission statement and the vision statement and doing a family contract and just basic things that it's kind of the lost art of family making, <laughs> right? Yeah. So this mentoring, We're- this mentoring bit is, is, is just, it's key to keeping that connection with your children. And even, even as the mom having a vision of what, what do I want for my family? What kind of a family do I want? Yeah. Have we really thought about that? What kind of environment do we want? Do we want a home where there's always a, you know, noise going on and, and what kind of noise or what kind of sounds do we want going on? What do we, what did we want to have it look like in, mm-hmm. you know, I know that sometimes when my kids were little, it's like somebody, I remember somebody asking, what do you want to have it look like in 20 years? And I was like, holy yeah. cow, that's so far in advance. But if we don't look far enough ahead, we'll totally miss the now too. Yeah. Because even if it's okay for five years, what do I want my family to look like in five years? Right. How do I want us to, you know, how are we going to interact? What are we going to be talking about? What mm-hmm. are we working on? What's important to us? Yeah. What, Super, what kind of interactions are we going to be having? It's critical. It, and, and it's more critical now than it's ever been. Because in the history of families, we've never had a time where it's t- difficult to define our purpose. What is the point of getting married? What's the point of having children? We understood that before it's, it was for safety. It was for economic reasons. Yes, it was for love too, but mostly it was for building things. It was building a legacy. It was, it was having people to, to work on your farm or in your little mercantile or, you know, help you make baskets or whatever it is you did. There was a reason to get together and have this family unit. And now it's, and now we just, we don't have it. I mean, it's, we don't have that, those purposes that we had before. In Democracy of, of a, a Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville, he talks about uh, one of the, as he's an outsider looking in on the American uh, culture in the 1800s, he, he saw something that I don't think anybody else would have noticed amongst, them, um, amongst themselves in their communities. And he said, the American people at that time, very, very religious. And religion teaches you to look way ahead, like to when we die. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he, right, right. he talked about how inadvertently and unknowingly that looking far ahead and that that idea and that habit of looking far into the future paid the American people dividends and helped them incredibly because they applied that same purpose of looking way ahead 
to their families, to their business, to their homes, to their everything that they did. They, they tried to incorporate it in their civic and municipal responsibilities. Anything that they right. did, they looked ahead how, because that's what they did. You know, I'm doing this, yeah. even though it's hard right now, because I want to go to heaven and I don't want to go to hell. Okay. That now the application, right. I'm doing this in my business. I'm sacrificing in the, in my business now to be able to have this in place so I can go into the future and do this. I'm mm -hmm. sacrificing now right. for on my farm and in my family. So in the future, I can do this on my farm and on, and pass this property down to my family. I'm planting this right. tree. I'm Legacy. not going to, I'm not going to benefit from the shade of this tree. Now it's going to take 20 years for me to benefit from the shade of this tree, but I'm planting it mm -hmm. now or the fruit right. or whatever. So that's something that has been lost Yes. As, as an American general cultural culture yeah. thing, but a great reminder as I read through the Tocqueville's words. Yeah. It's so important. And so you have to work harder at finding those purposes and those definitions. Being, we have, yeah. we have to work harder. You have to pay attention to it. It isn't on built purpose. In. On purpose. Be, it isn't be built on in. purpose. Yeah. Well, this has just been such a wonderful visit, Cher, and I really appreciate your time. I know you're a super busy lady and doing a lot of trainings and, and helping people get, you know, settled in their own commonwealth all over the country. And, and I just, I've just enjoyed this so much and it's such a benefit. It's going to be such a blessing to lots of people looking for Thank this you, information Chuck. and feeling like they can, they can do it. You know, I just want to yes. help people feel like they can do it. We, so many of us have done it. Your kids are going to be okay. <laughs> you're They're going to be, be very okay. okay. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to be okay. There's great resources out there. Just follow your yes. gut, do what's right for you and your family. So anyway, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And yes, whoever is listening that it's okay. You don't have to be perfect. <laughs> what is the next right step? And it can be a very little step. Yes. What do I do next? Perfect. What's the next one? So, and, and you will go, you will go on. It's like, you're going on this big journey up a mountain and you're going together and you're not saying, Hey, go walk, climb up that mountain by yourself on your own. <laughs> no, you, you get to do it together. And it's yeah. what an incredible journey. I'm a better person now because I've gone right. on this journey. Totally, totally true. We, we look, we look out at the Vista together now and go, it was worth <gasps> the climb. Totally. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, my Thank friend. Thank you, Chauncey. Have a great one. See you. Bye-bye.